it's been a month now since I put myself through a whole series of fitness tests, published that out to the world over on YouTube, and showed you guys how appallingly bad my fitness has got over the last few years of trying to build up this business. And in that video, I gave you some idea of my strategy. Uh, so this video is going to be an update on my progress and let you know how that's going, the evolution of my strategy, so to speak, and what I'm gonna do going forward. So we're gonna show you what sort of workouts we've been doing over there in the Turbo Training Studio and what we've been doing over in the gym as well. First, I wanna talk you through my body composition, which was the biggest problem I had. Now, straight after that video, I went out and brought myself a set of smart scales. Um, nothing special, just picked something off on Amazon. They were called the Ufi P3. Absolutely no idea if they're good or not. Don't take this as a review or endorsement or anything. They were a price I was happy to pay and the reviews seemed good. So, but what you do get is a report every time you stand on the scales of all the various things that make up your body composition, not just water, but your, your various protein, your visceral fat, subcutaneous fat, all that sort of thing. And it was actually quite interesting. And when I first got the new toy, uh, you stand on it quite a lot, you know, morning, afternoon, evening, and you build up a big picture. It's been really fascinating for me to see how my body changes throughout the day, how it responds to certain foods, that sort of thing. Now I'm probably just weighing myself once a day in the mornings, and I'm starting to see general trend lines. But you get a report every week uh, updating you on your progress and a report every month. So I've just had the first monthly report, uh, and here it is. Let me share it with you guys up on the screen here. So. I've lost uh, 3.6 kilograms of weight, which I'm really, really happy about. My target was to lose at least half a kilogram of weight, probably almost a kilogram, um, so I'm really happy with that. And I'll tell you how I've done that later on. I have lost um, just over a kilo's worth of muscle mass as well. It's kind of to be expected, and 1.5% of that is body fat. Still tells me that I'm 6.3 kilograms away from my target, which is to be under 80 kilos. Uh, by, by the springtime. So I'm still on track for that. I'm really quite encouraged by it. My BMR, my water, my protein is low. My body fat is high. So um, still got things to work on. Now, the nice thing about this monthly report is it shows you the graph because sometimes when you weigh yourself every day, you don't see an awful lot of progress. In fact, sometimes it can go the opposite direction. And by giving you this monthly report, it allows you to zoom out. Uh, and see how far you've come. And for me, that was really, really encouraging just to see the progress graph and remember it's all about trends, not necessarily day-to-day -day changes. So that was really cool. Now, I needed a way to make sense of this in my mind. When you stand on the scales, you get a report like this uh, every single day. It tells you all the stats, your weight, your BMI, your body fat, your BMI, your muscle mass, water, lean body mass, visceral fat, subcutaneous fat. It, there's, there's just tons and tons and tons of stuff on here. And every time you click into one of these, like lean body mass tells me that it's low and it gives you some advice. And at first this is really, really overwhelming. Now, the reason this wheel gave me such clarity of thought is because how I approach this problem is very similar to how I think I should be approaching my body composition problem. And that is, when it's wheels that are really, really untrue like this all over the place, the first thing you need to do is get the center of the rim in line with the center of the hub. This is just the same as getting my body weight, my, body comp my BMI in the healthy range. And all those other little details will start to fall into place once I've done that. So how I achieve that one major thing is the main focus. The great news about it is just like a wheel, the tools involved in getting that very first thing done it's simple, it's one of these. It's a really simple wheel dishing tool like that. It doesn't need anything too complicated. Um, it's only once I have that part of the wheel ready that I can then start thinking about the lateral true, the radial true, and the tension meters. And that's when I use much more skill and I use much more scientific instruments, like I might have a wheel tension gauge and a DTI, things like that. And that is when I can start worrying about all the things like my macros, um, what nutrition strategy I'm doing, how I'm going to work on various elements of my fitness and gradually start bringing all the little parts of this fitness report into line. But I think the headline, which is, is it in dish or is my BMI in range, is the first thing I'm doing. So I think for me, that's given me loads of clarity of thought. I hope by sharing this, it's kind of maybe given you guys something to think about as well.
Okay, I should probably tell you guys how I've achieved this 3.6 kilograms of weight loss. So this is the strategy that I've been using. This works for me. I tend to start my day quite late. Uh, the shop opens at 10 o'clock and we're on my feet all day and we go all the way through until the evening until about half past eight, nine o'clock at night sometimes. So everyone's gonna have a different thing. This is what's working for me. So my day starts with, am I hungry? My mission has been, can I wake up in the morning and feel hungry? I wanna wake up motivated to get out of bed and go and make a really, really good breakfast and start my day. If I don't wake up hungry, then I've done something wrong the day before. So this is my main thing. So breakfast, am I hungry? If, if the answer to that is yes, I've got a ravenous appetite, that's brilliant. I'm gonna have two poached eggs on toast, plus vegetables, maybe some bacon, and two slices of toast. Now, I know poached eggs, I, I have been making poached eggs probably the last couple of decades of my life. It's like a religion uh, to me, but um, everyone's got their own thing. That just works for me, and that is my treat. That's one of my favorite things to have. If the answer to that is no, and I don't wake up um, hungry, then I know I have to eat enough to get myself through the day, so I'm giving myself three poached eggs and just one piece of toast. Therefore, more protein, less carbohydrate to try and offset that, but still give me some energy to get through my day. Make a real big effort not to snack, and I've been so good at that, um, which has been really difficult because some of our customers bring us some lovely cakes and biscuits and stuff, but I've been no, I've not been indulgent in that whatsoever. I have been a hell of a lot better at having a dedicated lunch time, and we brought ourselves an air fryer and a rice cooker. In fact, we've had the rice cooker for a while, they're absolutely amazing, but invested in a, an air fryer so that we can go to the supermarket and have food here on site that I can cook that's nice and warm and welcoming. And so, at lunchtime, I say, am I hungry? And I want to really uh, reflect on that and go, actually, is this just stress eating or am I legitimately hungry? And if I am, then I'll go and put the air fryer on, we'll have some flavored chicken using some sort of flavored rub or something like that. Put loads of rice into the rice cooker with a tomato, some other veggies from the freezer section. Um, other things I might have is meatballs, maybe some bit of pasta, might even treat myself to a burger and chips. A really, really good meal, probably about half past one in the afternoon. Um, if the answer is no, that I'm still not feeling hungry, so I had a big breakfast or I've not been um, working so hard during the day, maybe I've been a bit more at my desk doing some video editing, then I will probably just have chicken and salad or a soup, something a lot less calorific. Then at four o'clock, uh, I'm going to ask myself that question again, is are, am I training this evening? So quite often I'll train in the evenings and join the classes that we do down here um, or I'll be going out on bike rides, etc. So at 4 p.m. I need to be asking myself, what are you doing this evening? Do you need to fuel your evening activities, which is normally either turbo training, in the strength room, or out for a ride? If I am training, then I'll make sure I have another meal. That's gonna be my next meal. It'll either be leftovers from lunchtime, um, or I'll make myself something else so that I know that I'm digested in time for when the evening training session starts. If I'm not training, then I probably won't eat. Um, for a little bit later and I'll probably just have a diet shake or a protein meal. Now, this, again, this is not an endorsement or anything, but I went online, I found some stuff that I think might just give me a couple of hundred calories and a few macros. Been using the Protein Works Super Savory Meals. You use two scoops of this. It's a bit like a pot noodle, but it feels a little bit healthier and it's just enough to stave off the hunger for going to bed. So you're not going to bed in a really empty stomach and then having a really disturbed night's sleep. But very, very strict that I do not eat after 8 p.m. That is my absolute cutoff. That is probably the one thing that I have changed in this whole thing is I do not eat after 8 p.m. And that has fundamentally changed how I think about food going through my day because I know that if no food after eight o'clock, I need to be more prepared. I need to be thinking about um, not having fuel after 8 p.m. and waking up hungry. That's my main thing, no food after eight o'clock, wake up hungry, and that seems to have been working for me. Turbo training, remember I am specifically trying to train my VO2 max, which means high intensity workouts which target that system. It's actually a really, really hard workout to do because you've almost got to coax your body into it. You can't just go straight into it, otherwise you end up doing another sweet spot session. So luckily I've got this facility here. We can also run classes and we can invite people down who are also targeting VO2 max. We can run classes uh, and it's really good fun and we can all get involved in it together. So how this works, this is the program that we've been putting together so far. We always do exactly the same warm up, And that warm up is always the same because 
with these sessions you can actually sign up to them you know you need to get them done and they can be really really challenging and you don't really know what sort of state your body is in so the warm-up having the same warm-up every single time gives you a chance to calibrate in your own mind how are you feeling are you well fueled are you stressed are you fatigued how are you going to approach the session that comes up and that is really really important because if you're not on form for a vo2 max session you kind of need to abandon it because you can only really do these sessions when you're feeling good and you're well fueled and you're ready to do it so we all do exactly the same warm-up every single time just to make sure that we can calibrate our own minds how we're feeling then what we've been doing is working through a whole series of workouts so starting with relatively short uh, intervals and those intervals getting longer and longer and longer you can't really see on here but I brought up the most recent workout. Now, these are about 30 seconds on. So the green sections is when we're using the erg mode, i.e. the turbo trainer is in control, and that's gonna hold you at a nice steady 65% of your FTP. So you've always got that to go back to. A little bit harder than just general rest because we're trying to create that element of stress on our oxygen system. The orange sections are when we go into what we call course mode and it gives you a gradient so you can change gears now the beauty of this is because you don't be held to a number is that these are supposed to be absolute maximum effort and your maximum effort here is going to be different to your maximum effort here but the important thing is that all maximum efforts i'll show you that as we go and how we're going to monitor that so in this particular one we've done our warm-up we do uh 25 seconds as hard as we can in a five second ramp to really make sure we put a maximum intensity into that particular one. The first one is normally a bit of a calibration. People are trying to get used to it. You know, what's my vibe today? And then after that, we sort of stick in the same gear and we let the computer switch between erg mode and course mode. And we do those other intervals. And these really should be absolutely flat out. Now, what I've got up here on this big graph is my live trace of data from the, the workout that I did. So this light red line you can see here is my heart rate. And you can see how this gradually gets the peaks here get higher and higher and higher so my max heart rate is here so i'm never getting a full recovery my max heart rate is almost on the last interval the blue line is my saturation of muscle oxygen that we use with these sensors we've got here on our legs i've shown you these before so this is a, a nurse sensor so near infrared comes shines into your muscles these two sensors pick it up and we get into a percentage of the saturation of muscle oxygen now that means that as we do exercise we use the available oxygen in our muscles then our respiratory system has to try and elevate and then compensate for that loss um, and try and replenish but as the load comes off i.e we're not trying hard our respiratory system has an easier time and can resaturate i.e accumulate oxygen more quickly so what we're trying to do with these intervals is a rapid desaturation of oxygen i.e. get yourself into a massive amount of oxygen debt and then slowly repay that debt. So rather than just a full rest, you kind of slowly allow your body to come back. So the target for all of these is to hit a consistent level of desaturation, no matter how hard you're trying. Because right back here, I might be putting out four or 500 watts in that interval. Over here, it could only be like 380, 390. But the important thing is, I'm achieving the same level amount of oxygen debt. Now, this is still pretty much a warm up because as you see, we come into this full rest here, we get a massive resaturation and the high levels of oxygen saturation of the muscles. And then we come into the true bits of VO2 max training. These are two and a half minutes of absolute flat out as hard as you possibly can. And we'll see rapid desaturation holding that desaturation for a long, long time. These are hard. We get the rest for resaturation and then we try and emulate now the sign i know this has been a good workout is because i can't emulate it therefore i've stressed my body in this workout and this is now putting under a little bit of strain workout done now when you're doing these sort of workouts you need to work yourself up you need to sort of be going through 30 seconds on 30 seconds off going through tabata and wingate methods up until the full norwegian and as we go through the season, we'll be making these sections longer and longer up to about four minutes, which is perfect VO2. But like I say, if you just drop in straight away, try and do four minutes flat out, it's not gonna end well and you'll just back off and it'll become a sweet spot session. 
So what I've done is we're about to get on the turbo trainers. I'm going to set up a GoPro so you can see my data as I talk about it. Uh, I'll speed it all up for you and you'll get an idea of how all of this works in reality. Okay, let's get to it. This is my rider display here. This is my target power, my current power, my current muscle oxygen saturation, my maximum and minimums. This is all total hemoglobin, don't worry about that. You're gonna see a live trace of my data on this graph. You can see my heart rate in red. You can see my SMO2 values in light blue. And you can see my watts in a different shade of blue, a bit inconvenient, I know. But what you'll see is watts go up, you'll see SMO2 go down. Um, that's what we're looking for, we're looking for those trends. And hopefully you'll see me reach this minimum right towards the end of the workout. But first, let's get warmed up. Warm up done, and I think you can see the importance of a good warm up because look at that muscle oxygen saturation right up there at 77% that I'm primed and ready for a good hard workout. So let's get it loaded up. Okay, let me try and talk you through what just happened here. So uh, it wasn't a great workout. I could tell through the warm up that I was a little bit fatigued. So these numbers here are a little bit out of range for me. So a max of 84 is quite high and a minimum of 55 is quite high. I could normally desaturate to about 20%. Um, I was getting the indications that I was quite fatigued because during the first bit here, you can just see the light blue line, ignore the heavy blue line, that's wattage. As this was escalating, this should really be much deeper troughs on here. So all the clues were there. Uh, going into the big first desaturation was okay. Definitely felt that was tough. I was a little bit underpowered, probably only doing about 125% of my FTP. That would normally be 135, 140% for me. And definitely the evidence was there. During the second one, I couldn't do it. Uh, I had to stop and this is what you can see here. So I had to stop for a few seconds and my heart rate come down. Now I do this rather than um, turn the intensity down because remember I'm trying to do VO2 max training, so I want time in zone and the temptation is to change gear, make it easier, slow your cadence down, whatever. That's the wrong thing to do. The right thing to do is come back, give yourself some rest, either stop entirely or if you get a bit of recovery, I felt okay, I finished off the session, managed to get another good desaturation, get my heart rate back into zone and put my body under a bit of stress. But all the signs are there, probably need a rest day tomorrow. So other stats we can see on here. Uh, calories for that session. So VO2 max training isn't actually massively calorific, which is why I like doing it, because it doesn't really bump my appetite up in the same way that Sweet Spot does. So it's much easier to try and maintain a calorie deficit for weight loss uh, than it is doing Sweet Spot training. Um, heart rate is only just coming down to below 100. That's okay. Um, let's have a look what else have we got in here. Max power for that session was 476 watts. Max cadence, 124. Uh, max heart rate, 188. Now that probably sounds very high. My max heart rate is probably more like 192, 193. So um, I couldn't get up to my max today. I could tell I couldn't get up to my max. Back to muscle oxygen chart then. And was it a useful session? Yes, because I still spent good quality time in zone. Not as much as I wanted, but I also learned that three minute intervals I'm probably not quite ready for yet. I'm going to knock that back to doing two and a half minute intervals, um, get a bit more comfortable in that range and then come back and revisit three minute intervals uh, in a few weeks time. Right, let's go get changed. <laughs> okay, to finish this video up, I thought I'd show you into our gym and show you what I'm doing in the gym that's going to support all the stuff we've talked about so far. So right now we are in the power and speed phase of what we're looking for. So as I explained in the last video, I'm fairly happy with where my strength is and I'm not trying to build more muscle. What I'm trying to do now is develop my power four times velocity and kettlebells are a fantastic way of doing that. Now, if you're new to kettlebells, uh, I've just laid out our selection here. Now, we have two different types. We have a standard kettlebell and we have these sort of competition kettlebells, which are all the same sort of size and shape, but different colors. So they are actually get heavier, but they still will maintain the size and shape. I really like that style. A lot of people like the smaller handles involved in this. So 
top tip, if you're going to get involved in kettlebells, first of all, get some coaching. Um, recommending Googling Strong First, finding a Strong First coach and get some proper kettlebell coaching because if you do it properly, uh, you'll elevate what you can do with these so quickly. Uh, this is definitely not what you find in your normal ledger centre gym. Some quite technical movements in there if you really want to get the most out of them. If you're going to invest, I recommend sort of for men getting a 16, a 20 and a 24 kilos. For women, sort of come down one step starting at 12, a 16 and a 20. If you're going to start with one kettlebell, I'd probably say start with a 20 for a guy or a 16. Uh, that sort of will get you started. I'm going to run through what I do. It's quite a playful workout um, and then building up into some heavier stuff but very, very low repetitions. It's all about power. So what we're trying to really concentrate on with our kettlebell movements is almost mimicking the pedaling stroke is by doing that swing movement and concentrating on glutes and quads and finishing with a good powerful snatch at the top here. So I'm going to run you through what I do, talk you through it as I go and just yeah, follow along. Really powerful push with my legs, I'm not picking the bell up. And I'm not trying to get a massively high heart rate with this. So lots and lots of rest. It's not trying to replicate CrossFit or trying to get your heart rate up. What we're trying to develop is that big, powerful, trying to almost replicate what we do on the bike. And now this time what I'm gonna do, just to work on my hip mobility, and I'm gonna bring it into the rack position with some cleans and then do some squats. So. going to do a couple of snatches. It's a move I really like doing. It's really dynamic. You've really got to think about a strong core. Think about your technique. It's so transferable to cycling and especially mountain biking and off-road. It's absolutely unreal. So Cool. See, just having some fun with the kettlebell. Nothing too strenuous, but it does require some technique why I really recommend getting some coaching. So one more part of the warm-up to do, and that is a move called the get-up. And for this, you start on the ground, and this is really about time under tension and balance and proprioception. It's a really technical move. I really quite enjoy doing it. So, start, keep watching the bell. Warm up done, and like any warm up, I'm starting to get a good feel for what I want to work on, what sort of weight I'm going to choose. And today, what I really want to work on is some really heavy kettlebell swings. So, when I say those, I'm going to go for probably no more than three to four repetitions, and really concentrating on that really strong, powerful swing. So, probably going to go straight to the 28s, work up to a few in the 40s, low repetitions, lots of rest loads of technique 32 kilos probably about eight reps Finally, 40 kilos, a little bit on the heavy side for me. Aim for about four reps. You'll probably see my technique go slightly astray towards the fourth rep. That's the point where you put it down, you take a rest. So I know that I really have to switch on for this because it will throw me. So I've really got to think about being planted, being balanced, being rigid. For me, I like the heavier weight because it makes me, makes me switch on and then I learn more about what muscles I'm using. Transfer that straight to the bike, and putting down some power, keeps everything strong, rigid. Bike just goes forward. Okay, here we go. Whew. Feels good. Have to really concentrate on keeping my feet Absolutely planted, keeping my balance. That's what I love about it. 
Okay, that's enough of that. If you like that sort of video, let me know down in the comments. I'll see you in about a month's time and let you know how I'm getting on and what my new VO2 max is.